the Kamakura period, which begins in 1185 and ends in 1333. And as always, on the first page of this chapter, we have the historical chrono chronology and the art chronology. On the bottom, let's just read very briefly through the historical chronology. In 1185, we have the provincial constables, or Shugo, and the stewards, Jito, appointed by Minamoto Yoritomo's military headquarters and set up in Kamakura. In 1192, we have the foundation of Zen Buddhism, or uh, uh, in specifically the Rinzai sect of Zen Buddhism, comes in from China and is brought to Japan by Eisei. Uh, in fact, it had been introduced earlier. It says introduction here in your book, but um, I crossed that out and put foundation of the uh, sort of official Zen Buddhist sect because it had actually teaching, some Zen teachings had been introduced several centuries early, but we don't need to get into that. 1192, Yoritomo is given the title of Shogun, uh, the location of the shogunate, or bakfu, is set up in Kamakura. In 1199, we have the death of Minamoto Yoritomo, who was the uh, generalissimo, or the shogun, for this first uh, phase of the Kamakura period. He dies in Kamakura in 1192. 1199, we have the death of Yoritomo. The shogunate is moved over to the Hojo family after his death. In 1205, the Hojo shogunate regency begins. In 1221, the Jokyu disturbance takes place. Kyoto initiated anti-shogunate movement fails. In 1226, we have the court noble Fujiwara Yoritsune is selected as shogun. 1232, the law code Jo-e Shikimoku is issued. 1250, we have the Heike Monogatai is written. 1253, the Nichiren sect of Buddhism is established. 1262, the great Shindan, or the founder of the Pure Land sect, uh, dies in this year. 1274, we have the Mongol invasions, and it's in the plural because of the first one, first invasion by the Mongols famously fails due to the Kamikaze uh, winds and all that, and the, and strong resistance, of course, from the Japanese as well. And 1281 is the second Mongol invasion, which also failed. 1289, the death of the traveling priest Ipen. 1325, the first official embassy to China is set up since the Tang Dynasty. 1333, the Hojo Regency, which which had begun, uh, as I just mentioned, in 1199. It ends officially in 1333, and the imperial rule under Emperor Go Daigo overthrows the Kamakura loyalists. The Hojo Regency ends, and the imperial general uh, Ashikaga Takauji, who later breaks away from the court and sets up an alternative emperor and appoints himself. The redoubtable Minamoto Yoritomo makes himself the shogun, or the generalissimo of Japan, and he establishes the first shogunate. The valor of the samurai plus a timely hurricane thwart two massive attempts by the Mongol, led by Kublai Khan, to invade Japan. The priest Eisai, as I just mentioned, introduces or establishes Zen Buddhism, particular the Rinzai sect. Poetry is rarefied and painting is realistic. Okay, on the next page, image, we have image number 47. This is of the famous portrait of Minamoto no Yoritomo Gazo, in Japanese portrait of Minamoto Yoritomo, and it's housed in the Jingoji in Kyoto. And here we see Minamoto Yoritomo was the first permanent shogun. He wears ceremonial soktai robe. This is called the soktai robe rather than the general's uniform for this portrait. The seeds of feudalism. Out of the bitter struggle for supremacy between the Taira and the Minamoto, the two great clans during the uh, Genpei Wars. Uh, so out of these, this struggle came a new kind of government based on the rule of military men headed by a military dictator, the shogun or generalissimo. The man responsible for this development was Minamoto Yoritomo, who became general Generalissimo, or shogun, or the, of the first shogunate, or bakfu in Japan. So keep in mind that bakfu and shogunate are more or less synonyms. Uh, shogunate, of course, is the uh, English uh, rendering of the government or regime of a shogun. In theory, the shogunate operated as the military arm of the emperor's government. Actually, its control included the emperor and the imperial court. So the shogunate was, uh, in reality, up above the power of the emperor. Yoritomo's power spread to the appointment of land stewards and constables throughout the nation. And land stewards, constables, underline this in Japanese, shugo. Stewards are jito. Throughout the nation and through these two official positions, the shogunate enjoyed tax collection privileges. So began in the Kamakura period, the era of medieval Japan. Until then, the development of the country had been relatively peaceful. But the Kamakura shogunate planted the seeds of feudal government. And for the next 500 years, there would be a series of changing rulers, rebellions, revolts, and civil wars. The greatest hero and builder of the feudal system was the vigorous, clever, power-hungry warrior Minamoto Yoritomo, who experienced his first battle at the age of 13 and rose to rule Japan when in 1130, 1185 he 
inflicted a crushing defeat on the powerful Taira family. And the fall of the Taira family is what is depicted in the Heike Monogatari. Yoritomo was a product of an age that bred frontier warriors, knights on horseback dependent upon themselves and family alliances to beat back the aborigines who threatened from the north. Yoritomo was bred in an age in which hand-to-hand combat among warriors of equal, equal rank was traditional. He could and did proudly announce the exploits of his ancestors as he accepted a challenge to do battle. Many of the dramatic episodes in later Japanese plays were based on the sometimes heroic, sometimes treacherous actions of this intrepid leader. Many of his battles were fought by his brother Yoshitsune, whom he betrayed and forced into committing suicide. One early to- story tells how Yoritomo's life was saved in battle by the Zen nun, Ike, and how he was later able to return his or her kindness by sparing the life of her son. This incident may have influenced his later protection of Zen Buddhism. When the Zen priest Eisai returned from China, a full-fledged Zen master, he moved from Kyoto to Yoritomo's capital in Kamakura, where he became a great favorite among the rugged, hard-living warriors of the shogunate. So this uh, Rinzai sect of of Zen Buddhism is set up not in Kyoto, but in Kamakura. Um, Much of the influence Zen was later to have throughout Japan uh, began at this time. When Yoritomo died, the Hojo regions who followed him extended their favor to Eisai, and the Hojo regions continued to promote the study of Zen in both Kamakura and Kyoto. And we have image 48 here on the left side of the page. We have a mounted imperial bodyguards scroll. And on the right side, we have the same image here. And the names of these ex-emperor's bodyguards are inscribed above each portrait. Bows and arrows were the guards' only arms. The equestrian sketch portrays one of cloistered emperor's royal mountain guards as he sits astride a spirited horse. Okay, moving on. This Zen priest who bought a philosophy, who brought a philosophy to the warriors, also brought one of the great cornerstones of Japanese culture. From China, he carried seeds for the planting of tea, or tsa, as we say in Chinese. In Japanese, this, of course, gets rendered as cha, o cha no cha, and he preached that this non-intoxicating beverage was a health-giving elixir that would bring long life to those who imbibed it. So Eisei... Uh, went to China and he brought back with him not only the Rinzai sect of Zen Buddhism but also Tsa. Though many good things had come to the Japanese from China their contact with the mainland was soon to be most Im- unpleasant. The great Khan, Kublai Khan, sent envoys to Japan demanding capitulation and threatening invasion should the rulers refuse. So this happens again in 1274 and again in 1281. The shogunate did refuse and the result was two invasions. The Mongols were repulsed but at such a cost to the Kamakura treasury that it never recovered. Weakened financially, the shogunate fell to the clique led by the emperor Godaigo, who at the close of the Kamakura period attempted to restore the power of the imperial household. Okay, next page we have image number 49. This is the Buddhist hell scroll. These are sinners who have descended into the Jigoku, or hell. They are burning in a river of fire representing one of the many horrors that they must face. Buddhism offers many hells for evildoers. Punishment for murder, stealing, adultery was vividly portrayed in these Jigoku Emaki scrolls. Visions of hell. Ideas of heaven and hell were written down with great imagination and vividly painted beginning in the Heian period and extending into the Kamakura period. The Buddhist priest Genshin was the first priest to preach and write of the many horrors of hell. His book describing the tortures of hell and the rewards of paradise became the most important religious works of its time. So underline this name Genshin and we will look into some of the details of his life and his contributions to Buddhist thought in this period. Genshin told of hells where sinners were forced to attack one another, cutting each other's bodies until only bones remained, or where the flesh was slowly sliced off the victim by demons. This was a hell of repeated torture. Sinners, after being cut up, were quickly revived only to have the painful process begin again. Into this hell, murderers were cast. In other hells, people were slowly devoured by loathsome insects, boiled alive, ground between stones, or endured a rain of sharp, flaming swords. The joys of paradise were as countless as the horrors of hell. They included the joy of being born again, of being welcomed into the company of saints, of becoming a supernatural being, of beholding the Buddha, of wearing rich garments, and of living a life of everlasting pleasure. Poetry and Painting And here we see the winner of a national poetry contest, Taira Kanemori, is immortalized on this famous scroll of the 36 poets. Highly rarefied poetic thought and highly realistic historical painting were the artistic hallmarks of 
of the early Kamakura period. The key to Japanese poetic expression is called yugen. The nearest translation of this is thoughts that are remote, deep, and mysterious. Concepts never simple or easily understood. The early poets strove for an impression of an emotion. They expected the reader to feel the sentiment engendered by the poem and even to understand a meaning, although the meaning was not expressed in words. Yugen is something like the effect of looking through a mist or finding many meanings in the sound of a single flute playing in the night. The top of the page, we have image 51 from the same uh, Sanju Roku Kaseng Emaki, and this is of Lady Kodai no Kimi. If poetry in early Kamakura was remote and mysterious, painting was not. Great historical events were realistically re recreated in lengthy hand scrolls, which unrolled from right to left. These storytelling picture scrolls became the foundation for the Yamato E, or the true Japanese style of painting. Underline that, and we'll go over that in class. Subject matter included narratives of recent wars, the rise and fall of noble families, and the dramatic exploits of warriors. Inventive artistic techniques showed the blur of rolling carriage wheels, and flames were said to be painted so realistically that one could feel the heat. The passage of time was often indicated by a mist or cloud formation above or below the action shown in the scrolls. Called kasumi, which is the word for mist, the cloud pattern often consisted of semicircular clouds joining or separating two scenes. So whenever you look at these old scrolls from this Kamakura period, look for the kasumi. Poetry and painting were the special concern of the court or the aristocracy, but they were not confined to them. They were taken up by the new warrior class, the shizoku or bushi class, and spread throughout Japan. The early styles in poetry and painting that had begun in Peon came to full fruition in this period. On to the Mongol invasion. While the Japanese warrior class through the Kamakura shogunate was establishing a comparatively stable state with strong and orderly government, the Mongol warriors of Genghis Khan were overrunning Asia and spreading chaos. In 1259, Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis Khan, became emperor of China and five years later established his capital in Beijing. He lost little time in making it clear that Japan was the next object of Mongol ambition. He started by sending envoys to Japan demanding surrender under pain of invasion. At first, the imperial court in Kyoto was inclined to compromise, but when the ultimata were presented to the shogunate, these proud warriors rejected the Mongol challenge with contempt. The envoys of the great Genghis uh, of the great Kublai Khan were insulted and expelled. One mission was even executed. The demand for unconditional surrender was to be met with unconditional resistance. And here also we have on the next page two Two more images from this Mongol invasion scroll. Here the famous warrior Takezaki Suenaga attacks the Mongol bowmen, though his horse is wounded. Fireball explodes in air at center of that image. Behind thick bamboo screens used as mobile shields, the Mongol warriors retreat as the Japanese press their counter-attack. Kublai Khan's plans included heavy dependence on the Kingdom of Korea, which after a long struggle had submitted to Mongol suzerainty. The southern tip of Korea was only 100 miles from the main Japanese islands. Seafaring was unknown to the Mongols, and an invasion of Japan was possible only by using Korean ships and sailors. The Koreans became collaborators. They collaborated with the Mongols, though unwillingly. The first Mongol invasion got underway in November 1274. It consisted of an armada of about 300 large and four 450 small vessels, so a total of 750 vessels, carrying 15,000 Mongol and Chinese soldiers, 8,000 Korean troops, and 7,000 Korean and Chinese sailors to man the boat. The invaders sailed for Hakata Bay, which was deep and well sheltered on the northern coast of Kyushu. They captured the islands of Tsushima and Iki after wiping out the small Japanese garrisons, which resisted to the death. They then headed for the mainland and made landings at Hakata, at Hakata, Zaki and at Imazu. The Japanese resisted fiercely, but their great skill was in single hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were no match for the massed army trained in close formation, maneuvering, and armed with powerful crossbows, moving shields, and catapults which could throw heavy missiles and fireballs. If the Kyushu defenders could have held out until the arrival of reinforcements, the Japanese might have won by sheer force of numbers. But the situation was saved from another source. A severe storm arose 
and the Korean ship captains persuaded the Mongol generals to re-embark their troops to avoid the risk of becoming isolated on shore. The fleet straggled back to Korea after heavy losses by drowning. And here we have another image from this scroll of the Mongol invasions. Here we have riding through heavily forested woodland, the warrior Suenaga leads the hastily organized Japanese cavalry to the battleground. Kublai Khan, without delay, sent another mission demanding Japan's submission, and the Shogun Nit again rejected the insult with speed and decisiveness. This time, the military planning of both sides was on a grander scale. The Mongols were determined not to be repulsed twice, and they took their time with their new preparations. The Japanese made full use of this respite. And here we have another image from this uh, scroll of the Mongol invasion. Here, charging into battle, the vanguard of 100 warriors is led by Shida Ishi Lokuro. Streamer carries the regimental crest there in the picture. The shogunate set about mobile mobilizing the nation's manpower and wealth for defense. At one point, serious consideration was given to taking the offensive by building a fleet capable of attacking the enemy's bases. This was finally rejected as beyond the shogunate's resources, but a fleet of small and maneuverable warships was constructed to act as a coastal guard. It was decided that the focal point of Japanese defense efforts was to be the construction of a stone wall 10 feet high along the shore of Hakata Bay in northern Kyushu, where the invaders were expected to, to strike. The purpose of the wall was to prevent a, or hinder a landing and to make it impossible for troops that got ashore to move in massive formation. It took five years of work by impressed labor to complete the wall. The garrisoning of this defensive barrier was also a tremendous enterprise. Soldiers had to be trained not only to defend the wall but also to man both ends of it, where the enemy might be tempted to con concentrate his assaults. Meantime, the great Khan proceeded relentlessly to put together what turned out to be the greatest overseas expendiary force for the world had yet seen. Scene. He set up a special high command, the Office for the Chastisement of Japan, to coordinate what was becoming a much more complicated operation than the first invasion. Kublai Khan had subjected the Song rulers of, no of southern China, and he promptly commandeered their fleet. It was assigned the task of transporting and provisioning an army of 100,000 men, most of them Chinese, from the defeated Song forces. The hapless Koreans, still suffering from the after effects of the first invasion, were ordered to double their previous efforts. At first, the king of Korea pleaded uselessly with Kublai Khan to abandon a second attempt. Then, in the hope of receiving favored treatment, he reversed himself and proposed that Korea take a leading role. In the end, Korea became responsible for ships carrying 40,000 Mongol, Korean, and North China troops. The great Kublai Khan ordered the attack to begin on January 4, 1281, but it was not until June that both fleets were able to move in coordinated fashion. The objective was again Hakata Bay, and the first attacks were again made on the islands of Tsushima and Iki, as they had done on the first attack. And here on the next page we have this large image from the same uh, scroll. And here we have as bulwark against second invasion, Japanese built high stone wall that is shown here in this section of the Emaki. When Mongols landed, the Japanese were ready this time. This time the force on Tsushima was well prepared and it repelled the attack. Iki, however, was taken. On the mainland, the invaders landed in great numbers. But for the defenders, matters went more or less according to plan. The stone wall was not successfully breached. Whenever the enemy forced an opening, the Japanese were able to plug it up. The pressure at both ends of the wall was heavy, but the defenders not only held firm, but were also able occasionally to press the attack. The Japanese fleet of small, fast, and easily maneuvered coastal vessels inflicted significant damage on the lumbering enemy transports. For seven weeks, the line held. Then the weather intervened again. A violent hurricane blew up over the shores of Kyushu and raged for two days. When it subsided, the great Khan's armada had been battered into uselessness. At least half the Chinese force of 100,000 were drowned or cut up as they tried to re-embark. The mixed force from Korea lost about one-third of its men. Japanese vis victory was decisive. The hurricane became known as the Kamikaze. The episode became a great patriotic epic in which the national deities, or Kami, through the divine wind, this Kamikaze, saved the sacred soil of Japan from pollution. Shintoism, especially its worship of the sun god and of Hachiman, the god of war, 
enjoyed a revival. Whether or not the Japanese could have, condi could have continued their resistance during the second invasion and won without the help of the weather must remain a matter of speculation. Fighting morale could not have been high in the Korean staging areas or among uh, Kublai Khan's Chinese troops, themselves only recent victims of Mongol co conquest. This must undoubtedly have been in sharp contrast with the spirit and valor of the Japanese fighting men, to whom defense of their country was practically a religion. Here we have the climax of fighting in the second Mongol invasion comes when Japanese hero Suenaga boards the ship to kill the Mongolian leader. And on the next page, also from the same scroll, in the first invasion, Japanese were aided by fortunate typhoon, the Kamikaze, which sank most of the Mongol fleet. And at the bottom, also from that scroll, the grisly aftermath of war is shown here when Suenaga brings heads of Mongol generals to Japanese headquarters. But the martial glory of the shogunate and its warrior vassals was short-lived. Now the economic strains had begun to show. Not until Kublai Khan died in 1294 did the Kamakura become convinced that another Mongol invasion would not be attempted and that the nation could safely begin demobilization. Japan had maintained a state of war or readiness for war over a period of 20 years. The warriors who had faithfully served the national cause demanded compensation and reward. The warrior Takezaki Suenaga who was depicted in uh, several sections of this scroll, supported his claim with three pic with these picture scrolls, which he had painted in color, commem commemorating not only his own valor, but also the exploits of other heroes. The scrolls depicted scenes on both land and sea in great detail. Many of the warriors were deeply in debt to merchants and money lenders. Some had sold off their fiefs to classes that operated outside the relationship between the feudal overlord and the warriors, and thus threatened the stability of this relationship. The shogunate was virtually helpless in the face of these pressures. Its own resources had been seriously depleted. The war had been victorious, but it had been a victory of defense, and there was no booty to be distributed. The shogunate resorted to desperate measures. It prohibited the foreclosure of mortgages on warriors' estates and the collection of debts by merchants. Such devices, however, created bitterness and confusion without solving the problem. It was the beginning of the end of the Kamakura shogunate. Religion spreads, so the people of Japan were weary of fighting. As the shogunate consolidated his power, they welcomed the precarious peace that settled over the country. Roads were opened up, and men and women traveled by horseback and palaquin with their armed retainers proceeding on foot to the towns to shop for pottery, lacquerware, and metalware. The towns grew rapidly, most of them around the large monasteries and shrines or along fine harbors. Out of this direct contact between priests and the people came a mass religious movement. No longer was Buddhism to be confined primarily to the nobles of the court in Kyoto and the leaders of the shogunate in Kamakura. So you remember in the Heian period, we have the Tendai sect, which is pretty much limited to the nobles and the aristocracy of the Heian period, as well as the uh, Shingon, which is the uh, esoteric sect, which is definitely not meant for the masses. But now we have these mass uh, popular uh, sects of Buddhism that start to rise. A religious fervor based on a single precept swept the country. Namely, that escape from the terrors of hell and the assurance of salvation could come from faith in the compassionate manifestation of the Buddha called Amida. That those who called upon his name Amida and believed in Amida could enter the paradise of the Jodo, the pure land. This simple path to salvation was followed by another concept, which also made thousands of converts. It was led by an intelligent, stubborn priest named Nichiren. Instead of one Buddhist concept, he taught the trinity of Buddha, the historical Buddha whose body was transformed, the universal Buddha, which is the law, and the eternal Buddha of compassion and bliss. By acceptance of the trinity and by calling upon them, enlightenment and salvation could be attained in Nichiren's view. These two religious forms, the Jodo Shu and the Nichiren form of Buddhism were easily understood by peasants, by artisans, by scholars, by artists, and by samurai. Throughout the provinces, men and women joyfully accepted them. Okay, the next page we have image 54, the traveling priests. In medieval Japan, monks and priests traveled throughout the country carrying with them ideas of a better way of life. Some brought not only religious instruction, but also education and entertainment. The first of the great traveling priests was named Kuya, and he lived between the years 903 
and 972 in the mid Heian period. He led the people in dance to the tune of a small bell which hung around his neck. So his style of uh, dancing, of uh, saying, of praying while dancing is known as the Odori Nembutsu. Odori is to dance and Nembutsu. Kuya attained gener- great popularity and wor- wrote many short poems which he taught the people to chant while dancing. His influence was especially wide in peasant villages. For his was a practical approach to the problems of daily existence. Although Kuya led his followers in the dance in the evenings, he taught them to build roads, bridges, and to dig wells in the daytime. Another early Tendai priest is named Ryo Ning, and he brought his message of hope through song instead of dance. His fine voice and great knowledge of traditional Buddhist music made him a popular figure. Best known of all of the traveling missionaries was the devout but unconventional priest I. Ben. Ip Ben combined the ideas of his predecessors by teaching that singing and dancing as a way of worship could bring enlightenment. Ip Ben believed that the Buddha was everywhere, and so he traveled up the mountains, over dusty roadways, waded through streams, slept in the open, finding manifestations of his master. And it was Ip Ben who popularized this dancing, praying ceremony. And here the traveling priest Ip Ben, shown at the top left, there he is up there, was a hero to the common people and saw many sights as he roamed the countryside. Above, men and women swim in a river near Kyoto. This may be the earliest record of a Japanese woman swimming. The precepts of Ipen, and this image here on this final page is also from the Ipen scroll. Here we see Ipen carrying all of his worldly possessions, takes his message of piety, love, and honor to the village in Omi province. So Ipen's simplicity, his energy, and good humor made him almost a legendary figure throughout Japan. He taught simple, easy-to-follow rules for good Good conduct. Among his precepts were respect for the beliefs of others, reverence for the Buddha and his law and the priests, compassion and self-criticism, but not criticism of others. Avoidance of lust, greed, and anger were also central to his teachings, and trust in the law of love, and the repetition of devout prayers to evoke the grace of Amida. All right, that's the end of this chapter. We will discuss uh, the Kamakura period and its art and its historical context in detail in class. I will see you all then.